if people could. Hi, everyone. Hello. Everybody, please. Come on in. Join us. Steve, you're going to have to do some work on getting this the right height. So I have a feeling it's not going to be right for you. Come on in, everyone. Oops. Is anybody good with microphones? <laughs> Sorry. If, if I can screw things up, I will. Oh, just kind of intuitive that way. Yeah. OK. Yeah, that's good. And then the next person is super tall, so OK. Come on in, lovely people. All right, we're going to get started. That means that even the rambunctious people in the back corner. Um, anyway, hi, everyone. I'm Andrea. I'm with Lighthouse Writers Workshop. I'm so thrilled to have you all here tonight. Um, this is Lit Fest 2022. I have to keep saying that over and over again because I feel like we missed a couple years. And I keep wanting to say 2020. Is anybody else on that page? Me and Steve? OK, a few of us, a few of us. Um, so tonight, we're going to be hearing from some of our visiting authors, which is very exciting. Um, this includes Steve Almond, Emily Rapp Black, Percival Everett, 
and Tiffany Yannick. So we're very excited about those four, but just to keep the suspense building, I have a few announcements first, um, which is that right after this reading, we kind of insist that you stick around. We've got the Denver Noir reading featuring Alan Brooks, Amy Dreyer, Twana Latrice Hill. Is she back there? Oh, she's off doing something. Um, Matangi Subramanian, Cynthia Swanson, and David Heska Wanbley Wyden. So they will be reading after this reading. So, so stay and enjoy. Um, for those of you here in person, you guys know this. Take phone calls outside, etc. cetera. Um, we will have a chance after this reading to ask probing difficult questions of each panelist. And when you do that, you can go up to that microphone and face them when you ask them, whatever you're going to ask them. Uh, and if you'd like to purchase a book and have it signed by any of the readers tonight, please visit Matter's pop-up bookstore We're right back there. Our lovely partners at Matter have put, a, put together a lovely bookstore. Um, finally, if you're looking for classes and workshops that still have space left, please see the info booth um, for our cheat sheet. So anyway, without further ado, we have to thank York Street Yards for this space. I know it hasn't always been perfectly air conditioned, but we have learned that, that we can get it a little cooler than it was that first night. So hopefully that's worked out for most of you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first reader, which by reasons having to do with the alphabet is Steve Almond. He is the author of 11 books of fiction and nonfiction, including the New York Times bestsellers Candy Freak and Against Football. After many failed efforts, I think he wrote that part of his bio, his debut novel, All the Secrets of the World, was published this spring. Please run, don't walk to purchase that at Matter. The book has been optioned by 20th Century Fox, and based on an excerpt, Almond was awarded a grant from the National Endowment of the Arts. Great. And also known as For the Arts, National Endowment for the Arts. Um, his essays and reviews have been published in venues ranging from the New York Times Magazine to Plowshares to Poets and Writers, and his short fiction has appeared in the Best American Short Stories, Best American Mysteries, and the Best American Erotica. Almond co-hosted the Dear Sugars podcast with his pal Cheryl Strayed for four years. Teaches, at the creative, teaches creative writing at the Neiman Fellowship at Harvard and Wesleyan, and also is a repeat offender here at Lit Fest. Please welcome Steve Almond. Ooh, okay, thank you guys. Here we are in this beautiful, intimate airport hangar. So I'm going to read from this book that uh, I, is the fifth book of novel I've actually written, but the first one that doesn't suck total shit, to use technical terms. Can everybody hear OK? OK, OK, OK. Um, so I'm just going to read from the beginning. It turns out I finally wrote a book with a plot, which turns, turns out that's important. And that means that there are spoiler alerts. Um, so I, you know, in like my short fiction, the, there were never really any spoiler alerts. It's like, the horny guy is going to be lonely at the end. Spoiler alert. Okay. So in this book, there are a whole bunch of spoiler alerts because it does have a plot. So I'm going to read from the beginning. All you need to know is that the book is about or starts as being about the unlikely friendship between two young women, a woman named Lorena Sines, um, who is uh, Honduran-American. And she's paired with a wealthy classmate named Jenny Stallworth. Um, and th this is all happening in 1981 in Sacramento, California, the dawn of the Reagan era. And uh, she's kind of dazzled by the Stallworths and really wants to, she walks into their house and is super interested in how they live. And the parents are super interested in her for various effed up reasons that become clear to the reader eventually. So I'll just read this. I think it makes sense. Jenny, that's Jenny Stallworth, was staring at her tender, unhappy face in the mirror 
when she mentioned in the blithe way she had that her family was going on a camping trip the next weekend and that Lorena was invited. It's like Death Valley or whatever. Remember, this is 1981, although this is still how people speak. It's like Death Valley or whatever, not the actual place, but around there. This was in the minutes after science, the brief portion of the day during which Jenny and Lorena consorted. They were in the bathroom behind the portable classrooms where they wouldn't be seen together. Eighth grade was what it was, a tender, blemished version of the world to come. Have your mom call if she's got questions, Jenny said, but her mom wouldn't have questions. Graciela, li uh, I'm sorry, but her mom wouldn't have questions. It was enough to know that Lorena was spending time with a good family. On the appointed morning, Rosemary, that's um, the mom, Rosemary Stallworth, drove the girls in her Cadillac. They sat in the back seat as if they were being chauffeured and zoomed south into the hot belly of the state. This is California. The highways that stunk of cow shit and garlic, the wide green fields where Lorena's father had picked asparagus when he first arrived. Mrs. Stallworth listened to KFRC, the top 40 station. She sang along to Betty Davis' eyes and Queen of Hearts and the other hits Jenny pretended to hate. You don't even know who Betty Davis is, do you, girls? Mrs. Stallworth said, here we go, Jenny murmured. Mrs. Stallworth kept right on talking about Betty Davis and her horrible smoking and what it had done to her, the skin around her eyes. She had that talent of certain mothers to ignore the static of her children, to pretend everyone was a bit happier than they were. Yeah, it is funny and tragic. Yeah. It was more than that, though. Mrs. Stallworth wanted to talk about herself, those years when pop songs and movie stars still defined her. Jenny experienced her mother's nostalgia as an affront, a galling reminder that her own youth would someday dissolve into such tiresome monologues. But Lorena was happy to hear her stories. She asked questions while Jenny stared out the window. Mrs. Stallworth had grown up with money back east on something called the main line. She had studied valet and been a fashion model. An Italian designer spotted her at a nightclub and led her onto the dance floor. And by the end of the night, he had asked her to come to Europe. He wanted to get into your pants, Jenny said. Of course he did, Rosemary replied. What do I always tell you, Jennifer? Women don't enjoy the privilege of stupidity. What happened? Lorena said. He wanted to design some clothing. He needed a model. He selected me because of my height and my shoulder blades. Don't tell me you stripped naked for this grease ball. All right, I won't tell you. Holy shit, Jenny mouthed. Did you go to Europe? Lorena asked. Of course not. Mrs. Stallworth glanced into the rearview mirror as if Lorena had misunderstood the point of the story. I got married. Again, that's another very funny and heartbreaking line. Andrea is the only one who's totally feeling this. Everybody needs a little more wine. All right. After a time, after a time, uh, Jenny began whispering about Peter Stinson, whom she liked or thought she maybe liked, though she sort of hated him too. While Lorena studied Mrs. Stallworth's mauve sweater set and tried to figure out what might distinguish her shoulder blades to an older man. Your father has a surprise for you two, Mrs. Stallworth said. Lorena pondered where everyone would sleep that night. She was struck by an absurd question. Was she now a member of the Stallworth family? All right, so they get to the trailhead, and one of the surprises is that um, Mrs. Stallworth is not going camping with them. That's not really her milieu, and her asshole son, Glenn, points out that her milieu is more like the, the local Hilton. Um, and so they tromp out into the desert, and Mr. Stallworth is kind of gruff. He's a research biologist, and he's kind of gruff um, and kind of a hard ass. And uh, uh, he, the, the surprise is that he's going to take them out at night on a little adventure. And he, he puts um, snake chaps onto Jenny and Lorena and Glenn, Jenny's asshole older brother, who's sort of the me character in this book, I would say. At any rate, Jenny is not really about snake chaps. That's not her milieu. So she bows out uh, having an hysterical fit. But Lorena is really a, a really a brave person, and she's up for it. So she goes out there into the desert with uh, Mr. Stallworth and Glenn, and I'll just read a little bit of that. Mr. Stallworth led them into the darkness. He lugged an oversized lantern, which he set down on a small rise. Close your eyes and keep them shut until I say, do it, Glenn murmured. OK, open. An iridescent purple light gleamed out in all directions. Lorena's eyes scrolled an ocean of sand upon which now lay scattered scores of tiny glow-in-the-dark toys. 
the sort kids on TV pulled from cereal boxes. Then the toys began to move. These were living creatures, many-legged and scrabbling like tiny lobsters. Welcome to Scorpionville, Glenn said. Lorena glanced at the sand around her feet. A scorpion the length of a hairpin labored under the weight of its stinger, which hung like a fang jewel over the armored segments of its body. Don't be frightened, Mr. Stallworth said. He was suddenly right beside her. Yeah, it's totally reassuring. Don't be frightened. There's just like a million scorpions. Don't be frightened, Mr. Stallworth said. He's suddenly right beside her. I'm not, Lorena replied. What do you think? There, she cast about for the right word, stunned to find the truth in such a simple one. They're beautiful. She could feel Mr. Stallworth inspecting her face, trying to figure out if she really meant it. He took off his glasses and began furiously polishing the lenses with the hem of his shirt. For a queer moment, Lorena imagined grabbing those glasses and tossing them away. We're going to take any home, Glenn said. Mr. Stallworth pulled a small flashlight from his pocket and swept the purple beam across the sand. We might as well see who's hunting tonight. To Lorena's astonishment, he knelt down and guided a scorpion onto his palm. The animal was the size of a matchbox. Its pinchers pawed the air. Shouldn't you have gloves, Lorena said. You just come at them from behind, Glenn said. They can't sting backwards. They're not aggressive animals, Mr. Stallworth explained. They just want to be left alone. Tell her about the dance, Glenn said. Mr. Stallworth let the scorpion scuttle from one hand to the next. Yes, you might like this. During courtship, the scorpions grasp each other's pedipalps, their pinchers, they perform a kind of dance. It's called the promenade a deux. It looks like they're fighting, but it's just the opposite. It's how they select a mate. Book or fight, Glenn whispered in Lorena's. Do you see? You, you see, that's me. That's me. Yeah. Book or fight, Glenn whispered in Lorena's direction. His father glared at him. What did you just say? Nothing, Glenn said. Mr. Stallworth aimed the purple light into his son's eyes. There's a young woman here, Glenn. This isn't some locker room. It was a joke. Uh, sorry, that's Glenn. It was a joke. It was demeaning. Apologize to Lorena now. Glenn blinked like a scolded dog. Sorry, he mumbled. Mr. Stallworth returned his focus to the animal. You see these little hairs along their legs? He said, this is how they hunt, by touch, by vibration. They can register the movement of a single grain of sand from ten yards away. Why do they shine? Lorena said. Nobody knows. Fluorescence must convey some kind of evolutionary advantage, but it's still their little secret. Glenn asked his father to find a scorpion he could pick up. Mr. Stallworth scanned the ground with his magic light. These are your best bet, he said, sand scorpions. Aren't they poisonous, Lorena said. This species isn't too bad. She watched Mr. Stallworth, <laughs> she watched Mr. Stallworth gently prod the scorpion onto Glenn's hand. The, you guys so want the scorpion to sting, or <laughs> Glenn. That's like where you want this to go. Uh, the creature scampered along his knuckles. It looked glum, menacing painfully shy. Are you going to pick one up? Glenn asked Lorena. I'm sure she's had enough excitement for one night, Mr. Stallworth said. I'm not scared. The words came out louder than Lorena intended. More softly, she added, I'd like to hold one. Mr. Stallworth switched on the lantern. He stared at her face again, half in wonder, and picked up another one, bluish under, under the light, a gentle species, he said, its sting no worse than a wasp. She reached out, and Mr. Stallworth uncurled her fingers. The earth was trembling beneath her. Then she realized that it was her, and not the earth. You don't have to do this, Mr. Stallworth said. I know. Do you trust me? She met his gaze and nodded, and Mr. Stallworth lowered the animal onto her. No way, Glenn said. That's Glenn. Gets all the good lines. No way! The creature clung to the knob of her wrist, like a charm, slowly, tentatively, it began to move toward her hand, the legs rising and falling like jointed oars. Lorena's pulse lurched. She closed her eyes to keep from flinching. Tiny feet tickled her palm. She felt a dampness beneath her clothes, the dizziness of what was going to happen next. When she could stand it no longer, she opened her eyes. The scorpion was perched on her thumb, perfectly still, its stinger hoisted like a tiny scythe. He appears to like you, Mr. Stallworth said. Thanks.
You guys, that's only the beginning of the scorpions in this book. Um, and thank you for using the voice for Glenn, because that's the voice, I mean, ask Mike, that's the voice I use for guys. Just all guys. It's the guy voice. Um, okay, up next, this is special. Not that Steve wasn't special. <laughs> um, Emily Rapp Black is the author of four books of nonfiction, Poster Child, The Still Point of the Turning World, Sanctuary, and Frida Kahlo my, and My Left Leg. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as awards from the Rona Jaffe Foundation, Gentel, Yato, and others. She has published fiction and essays in The Sun, Vogue, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, The New York Times, and many other publications and anthologies. She is professor of creative writing at the University of California, Riverside, where she also teaches in the School of Medicine, and she's a regular contributor to Lit Fest in Denver. I know, I feel like a repeat offender. It's like, let me some Lit Fest. Oh, okay. So I'm going to read from Frida Kahlo and My Left Leg, which is a book, a short book that took me a long time to write. Um, and is about my kind of imaginary friendship with the artist. Um, the students who are in my workshop know that I can make like stick figures and that's it. So don't worry, I'm not an artist. Um, but I had um, a whole lifetime of imaginary friends. The, the longest running was Killer. Killer was around from six to 12 and then he went to college. Um, and Killer was very protective of me. <laughs> And then I found the work of Frida Kahlo, and in this particular chapter called In the Glass Room at Casa Azul, I'm talking about um, encountering her um, prosthetics and outfits in the museum that's dedicated to her life just after it was opened um, 50 years after her death. So it begins with a um, epigraph from Frida's diary. I've been sick for a year now, seven operations on my spinal column. I am still in the wheelchair, and I don't know if I'll be able to walk again soon. I have a plaster corset, even though it is a frightful nuisance. It helps my spine. I don't feel any pain, only this, bloody tiredness, and naturally, quite often, despair. And that was from 1950. Oh, is it too bad? Okay, is it too much? No? Uh, okay, uh, is that better? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. When I enter the glass room at the Casa Azul where Frida keeps her corsets and legs, her special shoes and prosthetic leg, I feel as though I am entering a sacred space with a touch of haunt. I think of Christchurch Cathedral in Dublin where the dehydrated heart of a saint was kept in a cage inside a box inside a dark, damp room until it was stolen. The thief was never apprehended. I think of the legs of the Holocaust Museum with their ragged canvas straps and scuffed leather shoes still attached to the foam feet, objects that never expected to be observed by strangers or preserved by anyone, reminders of tragic endings that have outlived the lost lives they represent. I think of the sections of bark that fall whole and intact from palm trees in Los Angeles during a windstorm. The next morning, the street will be littered with corsets stitched crosswise and up and down, a thick scar of matching thread and a crooked line down the middle. Funky lingerie scattered along the sidewalks and piled up in the rain gutters. In this sanctuary-like room at the Casa Azul, it is disorienting to see Frida's legs like this the fringed red boot with one side stacked higher than the other to compensate for the post-polio asymmetry, the Florida d'Alene corset with its silky border covered with colorful birds and animals, the casts painted with the hammer and sickle of the USSR, the brace with the gaping hole to represent the lost children, the artificial limb, the color of palm bark, a rusty red like the dirt on the Illinois farm 
where my parents grew up, red dirt is fertile dirt, my great uncle used to say, with a swoosh of blue and a tiny bell, a seamed place for the knee to buckle and bend, a dragon with a flared and flaming tail moving through an island of green paint. Colors spoke to Frida and she was playful with their messages. In one passage, she lifts a colored pencil from the box and free associates about the color as she writes. Yellow was madness, green, good warm light, magenta, Aztec. Tenderness can also be this blue. Well, who knows? The medical devices that thousands of people passed by as of passing a saint's shrine were invisible to most when Frida was alive, seen only by those who made love to her, talked with her, nursed her, knew her. She may be known for making her pain public, but what I see is a woman and an artist who demanded intimacy before any deep reveal, who kept some of her most personal art hidden even as she painted herself. The more pain she was in, the more decorative the devices became and the less they were shown to others. This explains why many people who know Frida's art and Frida's face know very little or nothing at all about her body apart from that, is, that it experienced great pain and suffering. This singular narrative is never the full story. And now here is the altar of Frida where you can make prayers and petitions for wholeness. These items from her collection start to feel like a debt that's been collected from a dead body, a grave robber's stolen object. She has been elevated to the status of saint, and people covet parts of her the way they once did a yellowed tooth or a ragged lock of hair or a half moon of clipped toenail from a saint's body. These treasures were not set behind glass, but instead tucked inside velvet and silk and hidden in a special place. A bit of shed skin kept housed in a thin wire cage and hanging from a pendant around the neck where it could collide with the heart at every step. As if a part of a different body might make the stranger who held it suddenly whole or save them him somehow. Is that what we want from Frida? A story that will help us heal ourselves? permission to use her suffering body as a tool for our own healing. I kept a lock of my son's hair in a locket for two years, but wearing it only called attention to his absence, and I finally buried it at the top of a windswept mesa and felt a vivid relief. My heart seizes and my face is striped with heat. Also, I understand that this is what I have done, coveted her story. And what my healing would look like is, in fact, just this for the object I wear to be regarded as beautiful, precious, dear enough to preserve and save and admire, not just to me, but to another person. Still, ooh, sorry. Burp, burp, burp. This is what happens when you do the phone. You're right, Steve. Okay. Still, <laughs> oh, come on now. Still, I feel like a vagabond with thief-stained hands, the way I often feel when I collect these corset palms after a Southern California rainstorm, the edges scraping together like the shells of June bugs that used to gather at the door of my great uncle's farm during the summer until they hit the screen and we heard them scatter like living, squirming rocks. I also feel at risk. I am conscious of trying to walk straighter, look less crippled, not allow someone to wonder what's under my jeans or what I might have been through. It is one thing to view an empty bed and imagine it in a body that is dead or dying. It's hard to imagine a death unless you have felt the audible lift in the air when the life disappeared or touched the cold skin of the body from which that life has departed. Whatever the body might have been or done, whatever it might have meant to the person who lived within it, gone. After the air shifts, time contracts because this moment lasted less than a second and is now forever. It is also easy to sanitize a death if you haven't seen one, to turn away from the gruesome possibilities of that story. Death is work. It must be worked toward, walked into. My son shifted and struggled and fought to die to the morphine syrup. He was not raging against death but toward it, and we tripped behind, screaming, pushing him forward, but also wanting to hold him back. Identities die, this boy's mother, and are reborn, this girl's mother, New identities emerge to solve a crisis. Rebecca Solnit wrote, writes in the faraway nor nearby, and I want to believe this, but what I want to do is to sit down on the ground and weep. I want to drop through that, pan that portal of Frida's imagination and meet her on the other side of every possibility as her true friend, no longer imaginary. I want to talk to Frida about suffering, about Tay-Sachs disease, a disease that killed my son. 
I want to tell her that after he was born, he was immediately turned around to his death, the distance between the two so brief, like a thin, short thread quickly snip, strip, snipped. I remember having a pinata at my sixth birthday party the way I was marched away from the red and blue horse, ribboned with gold streamers, wearing a blindfold. I was turned in circles by unseen hands until I was visibly dizzy, and then I was sent back in the other direction, my fingers turning invisible knobs in the air, searching for a door or some orienting hold in the darkness. Ronan was given a life and then turned, still spinning, to stumble back toward his death before he had formed any capacity for memory, that prerequisite for true joy. I will never forget this or you. Memory is the outline of a life, what delineates shapeliness and, from, and form and meaning. We make memories which may or may not abandon us before we die, but at least we make them. Ronan never did. It is still difficult to believe that any human being can live without narrative without the belief in the fortitude of their temporary existence of the shaping power of memory, made by my body, which was the maker, but not made to live. I feel Frida would understand. I feel she would let the story live on inside her without feeling sorry for me and without expecting me to ever recover from it. Oops, sorry. We're losing the mode there. Sorry. In the glass room between the bedroom and the kitchen packed with thronging visitors, just past the video footage of Diego and Frida walking down the same path we walk now, are elements of Frida's story from which nobody can turn away because they cannot live on without her. And I wonder how she would feel about so many people looking so carefully at all the ma objects made carefully by her and for her. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Nobody reads such beautiful and heartbreaking stuff from a phone as you do. <laughs> um, no, that was beautiful. Um, our next reader, I'm about to say something rather alarming, so I'm glad you're all sitting down. Percival Everett is the author of more than 30 novels and short story collections, including The Trees, which you must pick up and read immediately, Telephone, So Much Glue, Percival Everett by Virgil Russell, I Am Not Sidney Poitier, and Erasure. Everett has won the Dos Passos Prize, the Penn Center USA Award for Fiction, and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Fiction, among others. He is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and is currently Distinguished Professor of English at the University of Southern California. Let's give it up for Percival Everett. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I just messed this up. Um, I, um, I don't like reading. Um, I, have a, I have a migraine, and I apologize for that. But it's, uh, I have a reading disorder, um, one that, I, that, that plagued me as a child. I can't read line by line. So when I look at a page, I see the page, and I essentially recite what I've just memorized. And so if you read along with me, you'll, which you hope you don't, you will, um, you will notice, as did as people who know me well, that I, I edit while I'm reading and that I change things. So, and this is right in my way. Uh, I, I think I just found the spot. I also forget what I've written almost immediately. Um, and so when people ask me questions about what's in my books, I often look at them as if I were a deer in headlights um, because I honestly don't remember. And when I do readings, I usually just grab a book. And I really am seeing it for the first time. Um, so I'm going to read the first chapter and then a little more of, of 
the trees. Um, so here we go. Money, Mississippi looks exactly like it sounds. Named in that persistent southern tradition of irony and with the attendant tradition of nascent, the name becomes slightly sad, a marker of self-conscious ignorance that might as well be embraced because, let's face it, it's not going away. Just outside money, there was what might have been loosely considered a suburb, perhaps even called a neighborhood, a not-so-small collection of vinyl-sided, foot-level ranch and shotgun houses called unofficially small change. In one of the dying grass backyards around the fraying edges of the emptied above-ground pool, one adorned with faded mermaids, a small family gathering was happening. The gathering was neither um, festive nor special, but usual. It was the home of Wheat Bryant and his wife, Charlene. Wheat was between jobs, was constantly, ever, always between jobs. Charlene always was quick to point out that the word between usually suggested something at either end, two somethings, two or destinations. And what Wheat had held was only one job his whole life, and so he wasn't between anything. Charlene worked as a receptionist at the Money Tracker Exchange J. Edgar Price proprietor, the official business name, no commas, both sa for both sales and service, though the business had not exchanged many chapters lately, neither had it repaired any. Times were hard in and around the town of Money. Charlene always wore a yellow halter top, the same color as her dyed and poofed hair. And she did this because it made Wheat mad. Wheat chain drank cans of Falstaff beer and chain smoked Virginia Slim cigarettes, claiming to be one of those feminists because he did. Telling his children that drinks were necessary to keep his big belly properly inflated and smokes were important to his bowel regularity. When outside, Wheat's mother, Granny Carolyn, or Granny C, wheeled herself around in one of those wide, tired electric buggies from Sam's Club. It was not only like the buggies from Sam's Club, it was, in fact, permanently borrowed from the Sam's Club down in Greenwood. It was red and had white letters that spelled Am's Clue. The hard-working electric motor emitted a constant, loud whir that made conversation with the old woman more than a bit of a challenge. Granny C. always looked a little sad, and why not? Wheat was her son. Charlene hated the woman nearly as much as she hated Wheat, but never showed it. She was an old woman, and in the South, you respect your elders. Her four grandchildren, three years to ten, looked nothing like each other, but couldn't possibly have belonged anywhere else or to anyone else. They called, her father by, they called their father by his first name. They called their mother Hot Mama Yeller. The CB handle she used when she chatted with truckers late at night when the family was asleep and occasionally while she cooked. That CB chatter made Wheat angry, partly because it reminded him of the one job he'd had, driving a semi-trailer truck full of fruits and vegetables for the Piggly Wiggly chain of grocery markets. He lost that job when he fell asleep and drove his truck off the Tallahatchie Bridge. Well, not completely off, as the cab dangled over the little Tallahatchie for many hours before he was rescued. He was saved by climbing into the bucket of an excavator brought over from the floor. He might actually have held on to his job had the truck held on, had, if the truck had not held on, had simply and quickly plunged immediately and anticlimactically off the bridge and into the muddy river below. But as it happened, there was ample time for the story to blow up and show up on CNN and Fox and YouTube Repeated everywhere, 12 min repeated every 12 minutes, and going viral. The killing image was the clip of some 40 cans of, empty cans of Falstaff beer spilling from the cab and raining into the current below. And even that might not have been so bad had he not been clutching a can in his fat fist as he climbed through the teeth of the excavator bucket. <laughs> also at the gathering was Granny C's brother, brother's youngest boy, Junior Junior. His father, J.W. Willem, was called Junior, and so his son was Junior Junior. Never J. Junior, never Junior J, never J.J., but Junior Junior. The older, called Just Junior, after the birth of his son, had died of the cancer, as Granny C. called it, some years earlier. He passed away within a month of Roy, her husband and Wheat's daddy, 
She considered it somehow important that they died the same, of the same thing. Granny C., you're, ain't, you, ain't you hot in that ridiculous hat? Charlene shouted at the woman over the, the whir of her buggy. What say? I mean, that hat ain't even straw. It's like a vinyl tarp or something. It ain't even got breathing holes in it. What? She can't hear you, hot mama yeller, uh, the tenure, her 10-year-old said. She can't hear nothing. She's deaf as a post. Hell, Lula Bell, I know that, but you can't say I didn't tell her about that hat when she keels over from a heat stroke. She looked down at Granny C again. And that contraption she rolls around in gets hot, too. That makes you even hotter, she yelled at the old woman. How does she keep living? I don't know. Leave my mama alone, Wheat said, half laughing. He might have been half laughing. Who could tell? His mouth was twisted in a permanent, permanent lopsided sneer. Many believed he'd suffered a mild stroke while eating ribs a month, months earlier. She's wearing that ridiculous hat again. Charlene said, gonna make herself sick. So, she don't mind? The hell you care anyway, Wheat said. Junior Junior screwed the cap back onto his paper bag wrapped bottle and said, why the fuck y'all got, y'all ain't got no water in this pool? Damn thing leaks, Wheat said. Got a crack in the wall from where Mavis Dill fell into the side of the thing with her fat ass. She weren't even trying to go swimming, just walking by and fell on it. How did she manage to fall? He's fat, Junior Junior, Charlene said. The low gets lean in one way, and that's the way it's got to go. Gravity. Uh, Wheat, can you, Wheat can tell you all about that. Ain't that right, Wheat? You know all about gravity. Fuck you, Wheat said. I won't have that kind of talk around my grands, Granny C said. How the hell does she hear that, Charlene said. <laughs> she can't hear screaming, but she can hear that. I hear plenty, the old woman said. Don't I hear plenty, Lula Bell? Y'all sure do, the girl said. She climbed into her grandmother's lap. You can hear just about anything, can't you? Granny C, y'all is damn near dead, but you can hear just fine. Right, Granny C? Show enough, baby doll. So what you going to do with this pool, Junior Junior asked. Why, Wheat said. You want to buy it? I'll sell it to you in a heartbeat. Make me an offer. Well, I can put me some pigs in this thing and just carve out the bottom and stick them in there. Well, take it away, Wheat said. I just thought I'd bring them pigs here, though. That would be easier, don't you think? Wheat shook his head. But then I'd, we'd be smelling your hogs. I don't want to smell your hogs. But you got it all set up so nice with the steaks and all. Going to be a lot, of, a lot of work to move it, Junior Junior lit a skinny green cigar. You can keep one of them hogs for yourself. How about that? I don't need your fucking hog, Wheat said. Language, Granny C shouted. If I want bacon, I can go to the store, Wheat said, and buy it with my money, Charlene said. Bring them pigs on over, Junior Junior, but I want to keep two of them, big ones, and you butcher them. Deal. Wheat didn't say anything. He walked across the yard and helped the four-year-old climb into her pink plastic car. Granny C. stared off into space. Charlene studied her for a minute. Granny C., you okay? The old woman didn't reply. Granny C., What's wrong with her, Junior Junior asked, leaning in. She having a stroke or something? Granny C startled them. No, you redneck talking turnip. I ain't having no stroke. I swear a person can't reflect on their life around here without some fool accusing her of having a stroke. Are you having a stroke? You're the one that shows symptoms. How come you jumping on me, Junior Junior asked? Charlene was staring at you first. Never mind him, Charlene said. What are you thinking on, Granny C? Granny C. stared off again, about something I wished I hadn't done, about the lie I told all them years back on that nigger boy. Oh, Lord, Granny C. said, we on that again. I wronged that little, I wronged that little pickaninny. Like it say in the good book, what goes around comes around. What good book is that, Charlene asked. Guns and ammo? No, the Bible, you heathen. The yard became quiet, and the old woman went on. I didn't say he said something to me, but Bob and J.W., they insisted he did. And so I went along with it. I wish to Jesus I hadn't. J.W. hated him some niggers. Well, it's all done in past history now, Granny C. So you just relax. Ain't nothing can change what happened. Nothing can bring that boy back. I.
suggest that apart from the later on. Bill Gilmer, Shedrick Thomas, Ed Lang, John Henry James, Charles Wright, Henry Scott, Arthur Young, George Dorsey, May Dorsey, Dorothy Malcolm, Eugene Hamilton, Paul Booker, James Jordan, W. W. Watt, Lemuel Walters, George Holden, Will Wilkins, John Ruffin, Henry Ruffin, and Eliza Woods, Anderson Goss, Huey Connolly, Dago Pete, Laura Nelson, William Thambro, Isidore Banks, unknown male. Tommy Champion, Michael Kelly, Andrew Ford, Henry Henson, unknown male. Charlie Willis, William Rawls, Alfred Daniels, Manny Price, Robert Scuggs, Jumbo Clark, Jack Long, Henry White, unknown male. Reverend Josh Baskins, Bert Dennis, Andrew McHenry, Stella Young, Abraham Wilson, George Buddington, Albert Martin, unknown male, unknown female. Richard Perrier, John Campbell, John Tyler, and those are just some of the names of the 7,000 victims of lynchings. Thank you, Percival. Um, for a guy who doesn't like readings, I think he, he brought it pretty well. Um, and she gets hers, in case you're worried. That's not too much of a spoiler, but the grandmother does get hers. Next up is Tiffany Yannick. She has received critical acclaim and awards in three literary genres, poetry, the novel, and short stories. She's also an outspoken activist on behalf of the Caribbean diaspora. Her debut novel, Land of Love and Drowning, won the 2014 Flaherty Dunnan First Novel Award from the Center for Fiction, among other honors. Her poetry collection, Wife, won the 2016 Bocas Prize in Caribbean Poetry, and her 2016 Forward Felix Dennis Prize for, first, for a first collection. She has additionally been awarded the Boston Review Prize in Fiction, a Rona Jaffe Foundation Award, a Pushcart Prize, a Fulbright, and an Academy of American Poets Prize. She has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, O Magazine, and other outlets. Her second novel, Monster in the Middle, was published by Riverhead in October and is available at Matter. Please give it up for Tiffany. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. Thank you to Matter Bookstore for staying alive despite the pandemic. We're so appreciative to the independent bookstores who um, have survived. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here at Lighthouse. Um, thank you to Andrea and to Jenna um, and to Daria and to Torin for just like making this possible. I feel like I've been quite the pain in the ass and you've pretended like that wasn't the case. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you especially to my amazing students who all, um, for the past couple of days, I've been walking them to the ledge and they have just been stepping off and instead of falling, they have been just sprouting wings. It has been a pleasure to be working alongside of you all week. Um, I'm going to be reading from Monster in the Middle. This is the story of Stella's dad. Um, it's set partially in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. The book travels across the United States including coming to Denver. Um, and this passage is set in 1993-ish, 1968-ish, and it's um, in the voice of a male. So although I'm up here in a cute dress, you're gonna have to pretend <laughs> like I'm a dude. Um, and he's speaking directly to his daughter. Listen, Data, there is no way to know anything for sure, and thank God for that. Thank God for that New Year's Day, 1968, that day the monster was on my back, but then again, the monster has always been coming for me. I'm a warm-blooded person because of where my blood comes from, island blood. Thank God for that blood and thank God for that island, but sweet Stella, I had never been so cold. The monster was in the air. Maybe the monster was trying to yam me, eat me, but there I was. I was the kind of boy and I... 
I was still a boy who would come to wear sweaters in the summers of South Carolina, let my mother kiss my forehead that morning, then climbed aboard a plane, nothing with me but a bag, one change of light clothes suitable for the West Indies, a toothbrush, a razor, the last because my mother had heard that there would be no one there who knew how to cut my black boy hair, though she hadn't thought about my needing a winter coat. And thank God for that long plane ride where I was too excited to be scared and so I watched the sky and for that long sleepless bus ride where my sudden fare kept me from rest. Thank God for this St. Thomas boy in a bus, me not sleeping but looking out the window as it became winter before my eyes cold monster. Did I clarify that it was New Year's Day, that the kiss was my mother's last? She was dying of cancer, you know that part already, right? Sweet girl, breast. Though no one but me and a doctor over in Puerto Rico knew, I wasn't allowed to tell a soul because sickness of the breast or the uterus or any part of the body we call private, the parts we use to love, to make life, sickness in those parts was a shameful thing. And so I boarded that plane and climbed aboard that bus, maybe heading to my own death, not sure, but feeling also that I likely never see my mother again. But still, thank God for the burn in my mother's breast before I left. Thank God for her kiss goodbye that let me know it was indeed goodbye. I could tell you more about my mother, your grandmother. I should, for even she is the monster and her mother too. I just want to explain how this goes. It's a journey, but you're not alone in it, my love. None of us is. You feel alone, but you also take the journey because you don't want the loneliness. Maybe people go off to war because they want to be left alone, but left alone and lonely, different things, those. Me? I didn't want either. Just don't be confused by my life or all these lives. It's easy really to understand. See, these lives are yours. Have I made it clear that I am so thankful? Thank God for my memories and thank God for the memories that made me. Because we can't outrun the monster. And girl, did they make us run that first night. The winter air like pins in my nostrils. I had a bloody nose before a mile, but kept running because the drill sergeant was shouting and because everyone else was running too, no matter that I was in short pants and air colder than I'd ever known, thank God for those short pants, thank God for the ash on my knees that looked like a disease, thank you for the blood in my nose that busted out and coated my mouth and neck and shirt and scared the sergeants just enough. That night I shivered so loudly that a bunkmate threw his blanket on me, thank you mate monster, generous monster, thank God, that extra blanket, it helped. I slept, but it started again and again. Every morning, the blasted running, and every night, the cold and the sweating in the cold, and the sweat freezing me, and the letter in the mail before basic was even out telling me that my mother was dead. The question you must have is, what is at the middle of it all? I'll tell you, even though I shouldn't, doesn't matter. You still have to do the thing to know it. So what's at the middle? Myth and magic, both, no shame in that. We all know it takes a village to raise a child, but I can tell you honestly that it takes a whole ancestry to make a man or a woman. I would never have made it to my middle if it wasn't for my mother dying and for my daddy being already dead, because then I would never have signed myself up for the war we would surely lose, a war everyone else was running from. My father had been fighting a war his whole life. A white man he was from the continent, a proper American, but not white, white, Cajun, he always insisted. He had fought in a war or two, seen nothing but combat, finally too shocked in the mind and broken in the body, and so found himself stationed in the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas. But it wasn't sunny for him. Lived on our island, but lived like he was already dead. Absent without leave in no time, made a half-breed baby who looked nothing like him, me. Then sat down on the beach outside a rum shop, praying aloud to die until he did. But even that I am thankful for. Thank you, old monster. Thank you, dear suicidal poppy. I went to that American war to outwar him, but then my mother died, and it was so cold. And well, that wasn't my true middle. No, we are the middle. This right here is the middle always, and I am so thankful for that because though everyone was heading to die in Saigon, I was not, not me. It wasn't that I had connections. No Rockefeller father to save my backside, no joining the Air Force instead of the Army. We didn't even know about those ways out on the island. Army it was, my own no choice choice. The base cold as an ice chest, 
my lips frozen and my teeth knocking. No one could understand anything I said. I hadn't learned to talk Yankee yet, so I didn't say a thing. All I had to do was fake sick. Now, I've been living with sickness for over a year, close to it. My mother told me she'd never breastfed me. Baby formula just arriving on island when I was born. Everyone thought the powder was better, best. So mommy scraped to provide it for newborn me. What I'm trying to say is that even as a baby, I'd never seen my own mother as God created her. But then as a grown man, I had to face her breast, care for it that long, hot summer of love, the nipple sinking in, the huge red blister that took over until my mother dived into it, the blister and the breast. I was there taking care of sickness. I knew it well. Thank you, God. Black boy bile, the officers called it. In America, I was the black boy, despite my half-blood history, coughing up spit, all fake, but it fooled them. Remember, sweet one, I'd bled so bad those first days. It wasn't that I was a coward. It was just that I realized I didn't want to war with the history of my old man, not after all. I didn't want any more to hold up my life to his and see if mine was more worthy, not after my mother died. I never knew the man, my father. He didn't live long enough. He was my first monster, maybe. And I knew he would follow me, has followed me, but with a dead mom, well, I decided I wasn't going to Nam. I wasn't going to be the drink till I'm dead, Poppy. This time I've half mongoloid children, but still. His story is mine because I lived against him, and that made his life as much an influence as if I lived beside him. I didn't get that then, but now I just thank God. America believed me. Even though they couldn't always catch what I was saying, I'd been a good talker back home, talked to the doctor, talked to my aunt about what to do with my mother's things in the event. The army officers believed I was too sickly, too sickly to shoot a gun good, too sickly to even look like a good target, so sickly. Me? My whole life up to then, I'd never even had the flu. I'd sprained my thumb once, but never an ankle or a wrist. Sick wasn't my thing until it was, then faking it so well, made it so real. Now that's how you know me, Stella, your poorly papa, your hypochondriac dad. Well, the war. For me, there was no walking among tropical trees that might make me long for home, no blinding light just before the rat -a tat tat of a screaming enemy, no warm sweat in my face and pits. My war stayed cold and quiet. I was put to ironing the uniforms of those who came back dead. I ironed alone and in air conditioning. I had to keep the clothes crisp, ready them for their formal funerals, easy work on the body, hard on the mind, because it was Vietnam times, and so you know about the many who came back dead, and so you know about the many shirts I had to iron, and so you know about the many monsters that live with me. I never fought in that war. I ironed, and I did it well. Did it tender, like how you draw. So to that I say, thank God for every collar, for every sizzle of the metal when it kissed the starch. Thank you, God, for the dead who came home for me to dress them. Because their God, what happens to you is on me, my fault and my parents' fault and Vietnam's fault too, because when I saw you in that basket, you reached to me, and it wasn't like you wanted to be picked up, no ma'am, it was that you wanted to embrace me rubbed me on the back, just a baby, but already assuring me that I was going to be just fine, fine, fine. So you know about need, known since you were a tunchy thing, my fault, sure. But what I'm trying to say also is that you can choose against me, like I did my pop. It worked for me when I turned away from instinct. Go with your gut, my mother used to say, but sweet girl, the gut isn't always good. Depends on what you've been feeding it. Because regardless, this monster is still coming for you, is always coming for you. The undershirts hot from the dryer, yes, they came for me. And I was thankful for the heat in that cold, cold room. And that is my whole war story. No clearing of light and jungle of grenades, just a still life of stiff shirts. I was an artist in there of a sort. Pants with creases that could cut you. Being honest sickly since is the small price I pay, and I am thankful for my wife and my boys and for you 
the daughter who chose me, the one who cares for me best. I do thank God I'm only sick now because I wasn't dead before. And let me tell you, there were so many ways to die in that America of 1968. For me, it's going to be cancer, like my mother. What else would it be? Mine in the private prostate. The story of the monster on my back, the monster on your back, is not just one of fathers and daughters, but also mothers and sons and mothers and sons and mothers and daughters and even aunties and grandparents and first loves and siblings and second loves and third loves and who knows what else, it's all in there. Meeting you in the middle, where you are, where you always are. This is how the whole of history works, sweet girl. And you and me and the whole of us, we aren't anything separate from history. When the government released me, there was the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, the GI Bill, they call it now. It was that or keep working heat in the cold. Pushing an iron was the only skill I'd learned in the Army. I did it expert, but it didn't serve me. Couldn't go back home to our island of St. Thomas just then. There was no home there anymore. Not yet, anyhow. So what did I do? I wandered. Years of that, small jobs, medium jobs. Malcolm had been killed, King too. By then, I was American enough for that all to matter. It seemed like black manhood was dead. Guess that was the point. Took me a while, years, to get on a good path. But I knew I didn't want to be alone or lonely. So eventually, I marched to Morehouse, where the Afro-American boys went, like it was my duty. Yes, this is an American love story. Because on the first day of school orientation, there was a speech for the Morehouse men and the Spellman women, the two schools tight together. The speaker said that thing I gather college presidents in America always say, white or black, the person sitting next to you might be your future husband or wife. And me, I was at the end of the row. I was older than most, and I'd been unsure about coming to the big meeting to begin with. By then, I was even a little ashamed at having been a soldier at all. Death will do that to a man. So I had snuck in late. On one side, there was no one next to me. And I stared at that empty space for a while to think about that. It had been so lonely ironing all those years. No buddies to grieve over because they were dead, dead when they came to me. But thank God for that New Year's Day and for all the New Year's and New Days I am Thankful for all of it, every bit of it, because there in that great hall with the man talking about looking to our right and left, who was that man? I wish I could thank him. He spoke so well and so clear. I turned from the emptiness at my right, and there to my left, your mother. Looking at me like she'd been on a long journey just to get to that self-same spot. And when she said, good morning, I heard her accent. Imagine a Virgin Islander and at her feet, a baby basket. What year was it by then? 1993 must have been, because in the basket, you sleeping, though I would come to know that sleeping wasn't so much your style. Me, I didn't know yet how your mother could curse me like cursing could kill, how she could love like loving alone could make me live, how she could take a motherless man, me, and make a father and a husband, all I knew was I, I hadn't heard those St. Thomas songs in so long, sounded like my own mother. And then you made a noise, like about to holler, and me and your mother looked together into the basket, your eyes open, looking at me like you already knew I'd be your daddy. Your arms reaching out to me like you've been waiting, waiting for me to find my way to you. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that, that was amazing. Um, so let's give it up one more time for Steve Almond, Emily Rapp Black, Percival Everett, Tiffany Yenny. There's your summer reading list. Um, you're welcome, they're all available. Do you guys wanna come up for like one or two questions? Okay, you know what? They said no. How do you guys feel about that? 
You do want them up for questions? Let's, yeah. So here you guys come. Really only has to be one or two. Thank you. I lent um, Percival my book so that he could read tonight. So again, you're welcome. Um, I'll start us off just with, wow, you guys are amazing. You're all taking on really important uh, stories. And it feels like each of you has your own version of the sugar that helps the medicine come down a little bit. Um, whether it's humor or, you know, moving outside of your, your world into other worlds of art and, and things like that. Um, do you think about that when you're writing, about helping the reader balance out some of the heaviness with light? Um, or is that something that just happens? Steve? Okay. <laughs> Still in alphabetical order. Yeah, I mean, the way I think of it is that the, um, the comic impulse is uh, like, it's not something you hoist out of your writer's toolkit to entertain the reader because you're feeling anxious about whether they think you're smart or funny or charming. It's actually um, a mechanism in people's lives to contend with tragic feeling states. That's what the comic impulse is. And almost everything that we laugh at, anything a stand-up comic says, or that Charlie Chaplin makes, or that Mark Twain writes, or whatever, if you scratch the surface at all, or even just read the transcript, it's actually tragic. It's describing disappointment, and shame, and humiliation, and limited prospects, and whatever it is. Uh, we use our sense of humor, just like in our families. That's how we survive them. And so naturally, that's how it works in literature. That's how it works in storytelling on the page, is that when you reach a moment of uh, kind of pain, uh, the, the comic impulse is the thing that allows you to tell the truth with a little dividend of forgiveness. And that forgiveness is the laughter that's sparked in the reader because they recognize that pain too. And they recognize how absurd it is that we move through life and lose things and engineer disastrous relationships and fate intervenes and we feel trapped and all that stuff. And so we need something that will prevent us from committing suicide, and that's the comic impulse. Ditto. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Truth. I think that's actually really, I mean, you, you said it really well, Steve. I think, you know, the funniest people like me are actually de <laughs> like deeply sad inside, and I think, I think, you know, I do enough work with sad people that I think laugh or die is a phrase for a reason, and if you can't, you can't have you can't have the one without the other, and it's it's incredibly important to 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 evoke both in, in anything you write, in my opinion. Okay, I'll answer differently. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Echo, echo, echo. But also, you know, I, what Percival read second wasn't funny, um, but it was. I mean, it was a list, but it was also a poem, a, a kind of poem we might call a list poem. Percival didn't say that he's also a poet. Yeah. Um, and I, for me, I think I use poetics often to get the hard stuff out um, because I think one way, another way to say poetry is to say beauty. And so if I feel like sometimes if we, um, I don't want you to feel pressured you have to be funny all the fucking time, right? So like sometimes you have to just do hard shit. And I think poetry can allow that to feel like at least there is opportunity for beauty even as we go through the hard stuff. Um, so I, when, I, when I need to go through hard things, I lean on on language to get me through that. I noticed that I was like tapping my toe along with your reading, which is happens to me when I'm hearing a poet. Yeah. So kudos to you. Um, other questions from the audience? Are people feeling shy? Is there anybody on Zoom as far as anyone knows that has questions? OK. <laughs> None? Well, OK. Come on up, please. Or just to the microphone? Or does that make you not want to ask your question? Hi. I was just curious um, the way that memory played in like the different stories, especially maybe in Emily and Tiffany's. Um, 
whether memory was something to covet or uh, and maybe it seemed or to be grateful for, even if it's not always positive or like good memories, um, but also maybe being forced to remember sometimes things when you don't want to remember. So I just was curious about you know how you explored that and um, whether memories are something to be you know coveted or to to, to be grateful for. Such a smart question. That's my student, by the way. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, did that. No, um, I think, uh, I mean, there's no need to covet the memories. There's no us without the memory. There's no story of yourself without the memories of yourself. Um, and I think memory is, is something that writers definitely use and that we should use. It can, they can, be, it can be horrifying, but I don't think there's such a thing as story if there's not, if there's not memory. Um, I mean, neurologists talk about the fact that uh, that like, we know ourselves based on the story that we tell ourselves of who we are. And I feel like the fiction writer is up to something that's at that kind of level, too. Um, you know, my even being here, I've never been to Lighthouse before, but I'm here in this really strange way with people who are, have been for a long time part of my writing community, um, just sort of, which I think is also part of my feeling comfortable here and um, reading things that I'm, I was sort of, for some reason, scared to read that I read anyway. Percival was my teacher. Um, like, Laura, who read two days ago, was my classmate. Um, I have many other people in the room who were my classmates and mentors, and that feels like that sort of memory that we all bring together is also something that we can use in our work and that we share and that um, we can steal from each other. I feel like in class, my, in my uh, workshop that I did yesterday, we all made a story together that we all created, and then I erased it off the board. And everybody, I, I hope that people will still steal that memory that we had when we made the story together and there'll be multiple versions of this story out in the world someday based on the work that we did. But I think, yeah, we need memory. And we rely on that for our stories. Amazing. Um, Tiffany, actually, this is your life. We, we are all here to remind you of how you started writing and all your fears. Ah, is it my birthday? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, Emily, did you have anything to add to that about memory? Um, I mean, I just think that, you know, one of the things I think is powerful about storytelling is that the stories we're writing are in conversation with all the stories that have been told, have never been told, wouldn't be told, were refused, refused to be told, were not allowed to be told, won't be told. That to me is, you know, it's like a collective memory, exactly, exactly what you just said. Like, we're in that conversation. So, you know, it, it matters. Stories matter. Stories save people in that way. Um, but I like the idea of it stretching out beyond time and history um, and being able to make those connections across those divides. Do the boys have anything, any thoughts on memory? Boys. Boys. I, I, yeah, I, we, we forgot. <laughs> Just no. They have no memory. The question. They have no memory. <laughs> they forgot the question. Wow. That's what they think of memory. Um, one more. This would be great. We're going to take one final question. Oh, writing um, cross, like, male, female, kind of, because Tiffany, you wrote from a male's perspective. I think Steve, you wrote from a female's perspective. I'm curious, like, how you do that, how comfortable you are with it. Is, is it, a, you know, problematic? Well, I wear women's underwear <laughs> oh most of the time. <laughs> and that feels nice. <laughs> I mean, this is sort of, if you extend this question out, it's really a big kind of heavy question that's sort of like, um, can you tell a story other than your own story? And uh, the answer is, at least for me, well, actually your job is to tell the story that you're most intensely curious about. That's your, I mean, it's not your job, but that's your calling, that's your opportunity. And sometimes that is a story that is lodged in your personal memories. Uh, and sometimes it's um, a story of a character that the muse, or a set of characters that the muse walks into your life. And it's certainly ultimately going to circle around preoccupations that are lodged inside you and your artistic subconscious. And the force of the story, like a giant rocket, sucks all those preoccupations and memories and events out of your artistic subconscious. 
when things are going well, which is rarely, but sometimes, if you're wearing women's underwear, for <laughs> me. And um, I'm just not thinking about anything other than the characters if things are going well. And whether I am um, seeing them into their appointed danger and seeing them through it. And later on, it's certainly worth um, asking, did I honor this person's experience, this character's experience, in particular if you're writing from a position of insane uh, privilege, as I am, about characters who are really up against it and have faced challenges that I have been purely lucky enough not to face. But the basic thing that you have to do is worry about the characters and their experiences and whether you're honoring that and all your attention or all the attention you can possibly direct at them and their experiences is the useful time at the keyboard. And all the anxieties about whether something is problematic, I think, happens later when you think about whether you really adequately imagined yourself into that person's experience and understood what they might have been up against. First of all, you looked, which makes me think you might be interested in answering this. But if not, I would love to hear what <laughs> no, she says you would love to hear you. I'll go ahead. You know, we just make this shit up. And that's, that's essentially <laughs> it. Um, and it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You just you, you try to be as honest as you can with what you have. Um, you know, I, when I wrote the first, that first chapter that you just heard, I turned to my wife and said, you know, I'm not being very fair to white people in this. And then I said, well, fuck that. Uh, that's, that's, how's it feel? Um, and um, so I, there, there are times to be fair. There are times to make points. It depends on what the work is trying to do. So, again, it's, acting's not hard. It's pretending. That's what we do. Well, I wear no underwear. <laughs> Percival said he wears no underwear. I don't know if you guys heard that. <laughs> I wanted to repeat it to make sure you heard it. Um, I have about 27 different answers to this question. Um, and I have answers that I say in private and answers that I say in public. I will actually give you an answer that I normally say in private because why not? Um, one that I actually said to a student very recently here at Lighthouse. Um, so there is a a uh, famous white male writer whose name I don't remember. I hope he's, it's not Steve Allen. <laughs> um, nope. Famous kind of rules me out. <laughs> um, I think I forgot this guy's name on purpose because I want to be a good person if I ever should meet him and not like hate him on sight. Um, so I don't know this person's name or who this person is except that he is uh, famous white and male and a writer. And he was asked on stage once, and you guys, some of you may know this story already, um, you know, why don't you have more people of color in your work? And um, one, his answer um, was, and I'm paraphrasing, was something to the, um, to the effect, well, I've never loved uh, a black person. I've never loved a person of color. So I can't write them. Mm -hmm. And people were pissed off at him, whoever this person is. Um, and I would be pissed off at him too, but not for the maybe obvious reasons, because I think he was telling the truth. Um, and I think when I, what I'm, what I'm sad for him about was that his life is so bereft that he hasn't loved a person of color. But I think he is correct that he cannot write a person of color if he's never loved a person of color. And I do think we have to have intimacy, truth, and love with people who we want to write about. And if you want to write about someone who doesn't, has, it does not share your lived experience, you, I think you have to have a true, genuine love and intimacy to be able to do that work um, in a way that is going to honor those people. Um, so I'm glad that dude said that because I think he was telling the truth, and I, I hope his life gets better and more fulfilling. <laughs> I love, I love that. <laughs> and we, I think we know who this is. Okay, yeah. Also, I think that's really important because I think, yeah. it's, especially too, with certain bodies and um, certain metaphors and certain tropes for things, you can, you can kind of get that way. Lovely. Um, any final thoughts before we release you? All right. Thanks, you guys. This was amazing. <laughs>
Stick around. Stick